First, I want to thank Raina and Matt and the organizers. Thank you very much for in the invitation. And it seems uh, due to these uh, very lively conversations that you have after the every talk, it might be actually uh, very fruitful <laughs> for everybody. Um, so I will talk about DNA rearrangements. And uh, this will be uh, a little bit different. So no proteins and uh, machine learning in my talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, we'll see how it will develop. Uh, this is a project that I have worked uh, on for uh, some years now, almost 10 years. And um, I work with my colleague, Masahiko Saito, who is actually uh, not theorist. And I am more into um, discrete mathematics and formal languages and graphs. So. Um, those are the methods that we use. I want to start my slide with uh, my, my talk with the gene structure. And uh, I, uh, maybe many of you are already familiar with this paper, what is a gene uh, that appeared in 2006, 10 years ago. And for me, um, I was very interested in this paper because uh, as a mathematician starting you know, with interest in biology, I wanted to know what the gene is. <laughs> and, you know, what is uh, a, a definition of a gene? It turned out that there is no definition of a gene. <laughs> so uh, anything that codes something is called a gene. And uh, so uh, in this paper, uh, actually, there was some little uh, segment where it was uh, observed actually that RNA is really an essential molecule in passing information throughout the generations and it's not just DNA and in particular that um, there are protein coding exons from one part of the genome that combine with exons from another part of the uh, that can be hundreds of thousands of bases away so there's really shuffling of exons that are going on in um, and this is a uh, basis of alternative splicing, if you have heard of that. So um, we started interest, uh, getting interested in, in um, GNA uh, rearrangement, and uh, we are actually studying this uh, little um, uh, organism, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, there are several species of ciliates, actually, that uh, undergo massive rearrangements during their development. And uh, uh, the main, uh, it's a single cell organism. And this is the picture when the organism is actually mating and uh, separating. So there are several species. We uh, have very extensive data in Oxytrica triphylax of this, but there are also, there's quite a bit of data on Oxytrica nova and Strachiella nova uh, besides this. <coughs> so here's uh, what's interesting about this organism, and all ciliates actually contain uh, two types of nucleus, nuclei, I guess. There's a macronucleus and a micronucleus, and uh, the macronucleus is a somatic it actually is responsible for preservation of the life of the, of the organism and the organism, it it's actually encodes all of the protein and all of the other uh, uh, molecules that uh, keep the, the uh, organism alive. And uh, the micronucleus is m uh, called the germline and it's something that actually um, uh, is being kept um, as a storage information. <laughs> So here's the process of, of the mating process. Uh, there are two types of, uh, uh, two ways that, does, that the ciliate actually um, divides. It goes to, through regular cell division, in, if it's uh, normally f fed, but if it's stressed under stressful condition, then actually have, uh, undergoes mating. And during the mating process, actually, uh, the ciliate also have the, each nuclei, uh, uh, nucleus actually appears in many 
different um, in many numbers. So um, during the meeting process, the uh, one of the mic, the small ones actually exchange. And when they exchange, actually uh, uh, they uh, shuffle their information from one cell and the other cell. And so the new daughter cell contains one of the mics that has information from both cells and uh, it contains all of, it, all of its uh, mics, previous mics and max. During this process, actually, it disintegrates all of the information that was present, multiplies the mic, and disintegrates all of the nuclei that was actually present in the cell. All of the DNA disintegrates, <coughs> and from the newly formed micronucleus, actually develops a new macronucleus. So, and uh, this is the new macronucleus, and the cell continues. So, this is the the process of the biological process that the um, that happens, and the exactly this this arrow is where the massive rearrangement process actually happens, and we we want to study. We are studying actually this little arrow here. So during that arrow, there is really a uh, rearrangement on a massive scale. Thousands of genes are actually being, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, rearranged. What they uh, didn't say was that the mic, which actually contains, acts as a storage material, um, has all of their, all of the genes shuffled, all of the materials from the genes shuffled. However, in the MAC, they're all in the regular uh, genetic structure. So uh, during this process of reshuffling, um, this is just the jargon I want to use uh, later on. There are MDSs, so there are macronuclear destined sequences. There are sequences that are. Uh, destined to go into the MAC. There are internal eliminated sequences, there are IESs, and there are certain sequences that are pointers that are actually same set of sequences that appear at the end of one MDS and at the beginning of another MDS. So these are uh, uh, pointer sequences. In some sense, the ciliates have developed a list in the computer science. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So um, this is a this is a, s a structure of the gene uh, in, uh, for example, actin one in Oxytrica nova, and uh, so the this is the situation that appears in the micronucleus. So it's uh, MDS three, then four, six, five, seven, nine. Two is inverted, one and eight. And during the process of the development of the macronucleus, they actually, these, all these sequences are actually rearranged. <laughs> so this is the actual gene that appears in the macronucleus. And the pointers are aligned and uh, the, uh, uh, there are a whole bunch of segments that are eliminated. So during this process, uh, there are a whole bunch of things that happen. That is, uh, there rem there's removal of IESs, there is inversion, and there is unscrambling of the genes. And this is the process that uh, we are trying to understand. Uh, the genes in the uh, macronucleus, I didn't say, were actually, uh, it contains about 15,000 chromosomes, maybe 15 to 20,000 chromosomes, depending on the <laughs> Ciliate, every chromosome is one to two genes, uh, so they're all very chopped up and they're very small. Um, and they're about 100, uh, uh, 100 chromosomes in the micronucleus. So the, the whole qu the question is about how does this process actually happen? And, um, and it happens in a fairly short period of time. So it's a, it, thousands of genes are being reshuffled within uh, 24 hours of the development. So in 2006, 2007, there were experimental results that suggested that RNA may be involved. And uh, my student uh, and uh, Masahiko, we actually um, proposed um, a model 
and um, it turned out that we proposed a model that RNA, it's a term, there's a, there must be a third molecule, a template that actually guides the rearrangement in some process. And this um, uh, template actually turned out to be proved a little, a little uh, uh, a year later with my colleague Laura, uh, Laura Landweber, um, where she, she is a biologist and she's moving right now to her lab from Princeton to Columbia. Uh, so she will be in Columbia starting from September. Um, she injected a template, RNA template, into the, mo into the organism. And uh, this template uh, guided the rearrangement in an unorthodox manner. So instead of uh, having a gene 5, 6, MDS5, MDS6, she actually shuffled it MDS6, MDS5, and so forth. And this rearrangement actually was detected in the, in the, in the organism uh, according to the template. So th this somehow validated uh, our assumption. The way we actually project it is this is, I'm gonna, this is a cartoon and we have no evidence that this is what happens. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a, <coughs> so I this T is a template and I have a, a, a molecule X and a molecule Y and because the pointers are actually the same, s the same sequences, uh, the template actually grabs a portion of the molecule X and a portion of the molecule Y, including the pointers, and, and there, there are lots of nucleases actually at that point that cut the molecule. Uh, uh, when these cuts are introduced, then this portion here is complementary to this, so the dark green is complementary to the uh, light green because the pointer sequences are the same. So they actually anneal and join the two molecules together. And uh, at that point, the template may start releasing the, um, the strands. And once it starts releasing the strands, actually uh, the new cuts can be in introduced. And these new cuts are actually, um, because now the molecule is, is, is glued through the pointers, so this portion is glued to this portion, by cutting these two parts, we can actually have a recombination of the two s molecules. So this is, as I said, is a cartoon, not necessarily true. <laughs> um, but um, what we know is that the branch migration happens all the time, so this kind of situation happens all the time in the molecule. Nucleases cut the molecules all the time. So this, all of these uh, processes have been observed and we can certainly model these molecules and we have seen these molecules in um, experimental results. So, so uh, they are all uh, possible. Whether this process actually goes in this form, I uh, will know. Um, so I'm going to go back into math a little bit now, <laughs> since I was, um, so w how we model this situation a little, how we uh, try to understand it. So I'm going to go into Gauss codes, and uh, I presume s many of you know about Gauss codes. Yes? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, Gauss codes um, are actually sequences of symbols. The repetitive sequences, every symbol appears twice. And you can introduce plus or minus. So some of the symbols might be actually negative. Uh, so the way, I imagine that I have this uh, trefoil knot and I start through the base point. I'm gonna write down the sequences um, of symbols according to the crossings. And whenever I go through the crossing under, I put the minus. And when I go on top, I put the plus. So this is this would be a Gauss code, Gauss code for uh, the trefoil node. So it will be minus one, three, minus two, one, negative three, two, and so forth. So uh, we uh, we we're going to use this kind of idea to try to model the situation with the molecules and the rearrangement of the molecules. 
so I imagine that I have this Gauss code, but instead of now uh, using plus or minus and going up and down, I'm going to put, I have two symbols, I'm going to put two crossings. So I'm going to put two crossings and I'm just, I don't care at this point whether they're over and under. And I'm going to imagine that this is my, my base point. I'm going to go this way. So I, I go through crossing one first. Then I connect to crossing two. Then I go through crossing one and then through crossing two and then back to crossing one. Well, there's an extra situation here that this crossing was, co was actually uh, formed, but this crossing was not part of my Gauss code, and I call this as a virtual crossing, and I don't care about it. Here, I can introduce up and down, over and under, but this would be the crossings where I would care about from the Gauss code. And, and as you can see, having a Gauss code and having a, a, uh, a word that where every word, every symbol appears twice is really reflecting the pointer situation in the DNA. So here is my uh, gene, acting one, that we started with. And I, if you write down the, the, the DNA segments that you have here, well, I have some IESs, which will be I's, then I have the pointer sequences, then the MDSs, then another pointer sequence, and I, and pointer, and so forth. So this would be the list of the sequence that appears in this gene. And of course, as we always do in math, we <laughs> ignore all non-coding information. <laughs> so that means I ignore I's and M's, and I just write the pointer sequences. And I'm going to put a bar if I have an inversion here. Or I can even ignore the bars and not put the bar if I need to. So this, these are, are now Gauss codes in some sense. So we. There's no. Well, there's no one. This is the first MD, uh, MDS. So there's no pointer for the oh, first okay. one. The first one and the last one so uh, would not have the pointer. So 10 doesn't appear twice and, and 1 doesn't appear twice. So there are no pointers. There, there are the ends. So um, we, from this genetic sequence, we obtain a double occurrence word. And we get uh, the Gauss code. So now for to, to this Gauss code, this is the situation that I had. This is my Gauss code. And this is the graph that I can obtain by actually uh, placing crossings at ev for every symbol. So I have crossing at 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so forth. And if I start from this base point and I go through the graph, it will be, um, I guess, uh, let me see. Do they start from here or? I guess I start from here somewhere, <laughs> three, four, four, five, six, seven, five, six, seven, eight, and so forth, nine. And I mean, the, the, uh, following the sequences, you obtain a graph structure. And we call this an assembly graph that models the micronuclear acting one gene of oxytricanova. I have labeled here the, ver the edges according to the MDSs that we already had. And um, as you can see, there is the, the, the actual sequence from 1 through 9 appears in here. And it, uh, it appears from, uh, where is 1? Yes, it starts from here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we have double occurrence words, which are the Gauss codes, and we construct the graphs with rigid uh, four violent vertices. I want to mention that uh, I call them rigid because I really look at every vertex as being a crossing. So whenever I go through the vertex, I go through it and don't, I cannot turn around. And I can also talk about chord diagrams and chord diagrams already appeared in, in John's talk in the beginning. So I just want to, here's another Gauss code, A, A, B, E. Uh, so. I can sketch this graph, it looks like this, but the graphs, these graphs can look <laughs> in a very, very uh, complicated manner. They're spatial graphs and they are uh, very close to, to node diagrams. Or I can actually describe them in a chord diagram. So we can also study the chord diagram. This is a sequence that I uh, start from here and I look around the chord, uh, label the, uh, 
write down the sequence around the, the, the circle, A, A, B, E, E, F, and then connect uh, those that have the same symbols with the chords, so E with E, D with D, and so forth. And afterwards, you can also study the, um, I guess, uh, the graph that is uh, called the circle graph, which is intersection graph of the chord diagram. So they're all related starting from these sequences in some sense. And properties uh, of each one of these um, segments are reflected with the sequences, through the sequences. So now the operation, the, the recombination operation on vertices that we are interested in, the, the actual recombination, we call them as a smoothing of, smoothing of the vertices. If I have a crossing of this, this is a vertex, which reflects this situation of DNA braiding at the point. Th the recombination process actually aligns the MDSs and IESs together, or actually does the recommendation of, of the molecule. So the smoothing on, on the graph, smoothing of the vertices, corresponds to the uh, DNA recombination. So vertex of the graph is the DNA braiding, and the smoothing of the vertex is the DNA rearrangement. Uh, that's the mathematical, um, I guess, description of it. I can think of the spatial graph that we described as a physical representation of the DNA at the time of the recombination, but again, I have no evidence that that's what happens. So here's, a, here's the graph that we started with, the graph of acting one, and if I perform the smoothing, and the smoothing according to the description that I just wrote here, MDSs that are close together uh, are smoothed, then we actually end up with this segment, we, we end up with this molecule that contains all one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in order. So the actual the, the re rearrangement of the molecule is <coughs> depicted with this operation. So, um, so the general setting, again, we have the pointers. How many times do we have to repeat? <laughs> Three times, right? <laughs> so we have the, the pointers, which are the, the letters in the, the Gauss code. We label the crossing with positive, if both appearances of the pointers are, are positive, or, uh, uh, or both of them are re inverted. And we label the crossing negative, if one of the appearance of the pointer is inverted with respect to the other, the sequences right, of the pointers. Um, once we have those, we actually perform the smoothing, and the smoothing will be performed if I have a negative um, smoothing, negative pointer, um, P bar, then the, the smoothing is, goes opposite the direction of the arrows. And if I have a positive smoothing, the, then the smoothing goes in the direction of the, of the arrows. So it turns out that we have a small theorem that uh, if I do this process for any gene, for any recombination, uh, and perform the smoothing in the way that I just described, we always end up with a link diagram that has a component that contains this label here that has M1, M2, M sub K all in the order of, uh, in the orthodox order that actually appears in the, in the macronucleus. <coughs> so this was, um, um, uh, in some sense, nice, because the, I, I found this model very simple and very straightforward and very um, easily, um, it can describe actually the, the process very nicely. However, there's lots of other experimental results that things are um, way messier, as usual, than we expect them to be <laughs> in biology. So there, there are mm, uh, small pi RNA molecules that can be uh, detected. So this is a parental macronucleus. In the parental macronucleus, it is detected that there is a, a big um, RNA uh, transcription so the, the RNA transcription that actually contains all of the uh, MAC chromosome. 
And then this RNA uh, molecule is chopped up in small pieces, about 26 uh, nucleotide long, and which are pi RNAs, called pi RNAs, small RNA molecules. And there is a, a protein that attaches to this RNA and goes into the daughter uh, uh, macronucleus. And these pi RNA now are marking the MDSs that uh, need to be preserved, which is opposite than what it has been found in <laughs> other biological systems, where the marking is usually done uh, for the things that need to be destroyed rather than preserved. So this was kind of uh, unusual <laughs> that uh, that was detected. We have no model of, um, however, the rearrangement process, we are still not clear how it is being done. We have no, um, uh, no experimental uh, results for that, for the actual process. So there's questions that we can ask mathematically and uh, biologically. Um, what is the order of the rearrangements? Of course, the rearrangements, we don't expect that they are simultaneously uh, done. Um, are there certain graph structures or rearrangements that are preferred and has related to the smoothing order? And um, uh, what types of gene rearrangements can appear? And all. Uh, bunch of what is the minimal number of genes encoded in a given pointer sequence and uh, many uh, other questions we can list here so I'm going to go into the math a little bit um, so uh, yes please this this one yeah, so yes Yes, we did. Uh, the, the loops are detected, and I, I should have pointed out. This is, I, I modeled this as a cyclic uh, graph, uh, but in fact, there's, it's a linear molecule. So this molecule here is linear, and there's a, there's a, uh, it should be chopped in here. Um, so this segment here, which is the, uh, the segment that contains um, the gene, is really a linear molecule, so it's chopped. However, these uh, other parts are circular and the circular cyclic molecules are detected. And um, I must say that my, my student Angela, who was doing her PhD, went to the lab and she was the first actually to detect that two IESs can be flanked together. <laughs> so usually small IES molecules, circular cyclic uh, um, IES molecules are, were detected and were known, but we have now evidence that these types of cyclic molecules do appear. So, that yeah, that's, uh, well, again, <laughs> it's pretty good evidence, yeah. but you can never say. Yeah. <laughs> so we have that. <laughs> um, so uh, let me just use uh, some other uh, jargon. Um, a transversal is the cyclic component or a path from an endpoint to another endpoint. And I will only look at simple assembly graphs that contain only one transversal. So, um, so these are uh, examples of uh, graphs with one and two vertices, or graphs with three vertices. And they're all represented with, uh, with, uh, with the symbols, as you can see, they're all, uh, these are all possibilities. So, we wanted to figure out what types of smoothings, given a graph, what types of smoothings or what types of rearrangements we can actually um, obtain and uh, uh, how we can count that. So we came up with this polynomial. And the polynomial, um, anybody knows any, anything about graph polynomials? <laughs> yes? <laughs> Yeah, so they count things. That's the idea. The, the, the po graph polynomials count things. So if I look at the, each vertex, positive or negative smoothing, I can take uh, an n-tuple of positive and negative smoothing. So this S will be an n-tuple with p-bar and p's into it. 
And uh, let's mu, mu of s is number of connected components that result from the smoothings, and pi of s, number of positive smoothings in the s. And then we can look at this graph, uh, this polynomial, for a given graph gamma, two variables. The exponent of one variable is pi of s, and the exponent of the other is mi uh, mu of s minus 1. Minus one is because we always have at least one component. So if we want to count how many components were generated, then we put this minus one. So here's an example. So if I have this graph, you see how I'm doing with the time? I guess I have some time, right? Okay, I don't, I don't wanna. Uh, okay, so, y so the idea is uh, so this is this is the graph. It's one, two, two, three, one, three. That's the structure of the graph. And uh, you can uh, we can denote the the smoothing either this or this, positive or negative. But whenever we decide to smooth positively, for example, three positive smoothings, we'll have this p cube plus times t there's an extra component t. So we associate a term in the polynomial to the types of smoothing that can be introduced into the, um, into the graph. So uh, there are eight possibilities, and these eight possibilities generate eight different terms, and uh, once you add them up, you end up with a polynomial uh, that actually represents all possible smoothings that correspond to this, um, to this graph. So uh, these are uh, some of the lists of the first of the uh, assembly words with three uh, symbols. Um, not interesting. <laughs> Just to show you that you know it's something that you can compute up to a certain point. Um, the polynomial does not depend on the orientation of the transversal. So again, the DNA, the transversal actually represents the double-stranded DNA, so we shouldn't really uh, care about the orientation. And if I have a product of two uh, words, one after the other, so that means the two assembly graphs, I can actually look at the graph and I can separate it into two assembly graphs then actually the polynomial is, as you can expect, a product of two polynomials. So um, it, this reflects nicely that structure. And um, if, uh, if we have isomorphic graphs, then actually the polynomials are the same. In fact, I isomorphic circle graphs this is even stronger than we, uh, the polynomials are the same. So this is an invariant uh, for, the, uh, for the polynomial. <coughs> of course, the, we, are not, uh, we were not uh, inventive too much because the similar polynomial uh, is very much related to the Martin uh, polynomial. Well, <coughs> Robert Breider and uh, Henrik Jan Hugemong actually told us that if you look at Martin polynomial and the Kaufman bracket polynomial, they're all there. And also, they're related to the weighted transition polynomial of Joe L. Moynihan. So, <laughs> um, not, um, we were also disappointed at the time because the polynomial turned out to be not a very strong uh, invariant because you can detect two graphs circle graphs. Remember, circle graphs are the gra intersection graphs of the chord diagrams. Okay, so you make a chord diagram, <laughs> look at the intersection <coughs> of the chords, make a circle, and that's the circle graph. So these are two non-isomorphic circle graphs that have the same polynomial, so that was not good. So we gave this problem to, a st to um, an undergrad, in fact, to describe another polynomial, now with four variables, to count something else. To count not just the number of connected components and the positive smoothings, but the number of unsmoothed vertices. So in some sense, we want to consider different pathways of rearrangements, because if things are not doing, uh, happening uh, simultaneously, there might be some uh, vertices that are actually untouched at certain part. And we want to count the intermediates, 
and also the number of vertices in the linear component because the linear component keeps in some sense um, the segments of the genes that need to be actually preserved to be uh, rearranged. So, yes. Um, maybe not about this one, but the previous autoimmune example. Mm -hmm. Did you really, was that computable? Yeah, it's computable. Doing all possibilities? All those, yeah. uh, yes, my student at the, at the time, Igor, tried to, fi um, he came up with some algorithms that actually um, sped up the process a little bit, but not, I wouldn't say not too much. <laughs> okay, you, you still have to go through exponential expansion. So I don't have, I mean, for certain cases, in certain situations, you can do that. And particularly if you detect this part, you're all, you know, you can uh, el eliminate things. So yeah, but uh, in general, no. <laughs> so for this, this polynomial was even more uh, difficult to compute, but this is a problem for undergraduate. The undergraduate actually followed the structure uh, of the, the proof of the previous polynomial and was able to, uh, her name is Sarah Groom, I should say, <laughs> and she is now a graduate in Ohio State. <laughs> um, so she actually proved the same, the same um, properties as the other polynomial However, the computational part here is even even worse than 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 the one that we started with. So um, it is a very complicated invariant, and um, I I don't know because of the complication, we were not able to generate nice examples and to see what's going on actually, whether we can detect something from the polynomial that we wanted to count <laughs> because it was so. You, you remember actually. Okay, I'll go into the data a little bit. Some of these uh, genes have over 100, actually the largest one has 154 so, or something like that, segments. So I'm talking about graphs with 154 vertices. There's no way we can actually uh, compute this. <laughs> so <laughs> we, it was, it for us, was very difficult. So we didn't really get much of it. So we want a better invariant. So to count, say something about the intermediates. So if um, this is an activity, maybe, <laughs> to figure out <laughs> what to do with it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, the second portion uh, of my uh, talk will be actually about the actual data that we uh, have. The whole genome for both Mac and Mike was, were sequenced in 2014. And we actually made a big database in 2015 of, of, of the whole thing. And then um, uh, in 2014, we actually, the, they were detected 16,220 um, uh, contacts. And about each contact is about one gene, and one gene is, as I said, about one chromosome. So we filtered the data, and there were questions why we filtered the data and the way we filtered the data, but it was, it's very messy, as you can imagine. So in any case, so we trimmed it down to 15,000, <laughs> and, um, and then we studied this data D, and we looked at um, overlapping and non-overlapping, actually, segments. It turns out that there are genes that uh, share MDSs. So there is alternative splicing, not just alternative splicing through the actual process of getting the proteins, but there is alternative splicing going from Mike to Mac. So <laughs> um, they're interleaving the IESs, the external eliminated, uh, uh, internal eliminated sequences, turned out to be not really eliminated sequences, but they're actual genes inside the <laughs> those IESs. So they're all one inside the other. And they're non-interleaving, so 12,000. So we actually ended up studying this, uh, this process a little bit further. So I'm going to show you the, da uh, uh, the, the data of the rearrangements. Um, then we actually looked at the rearrangement maps. So 
when you sequence, you have no control which one of the strands you have picked, actually. Oh, there are four strands involved, uh, in particular when you actually try to uh, map them. So there, there's uh, one, and there's two, and there's three, and there's four. So there are two in the MAC and two in the MAC. So there are four possibilities, right? And each one of these four possibilities, in some sense, represents uh, the same pattern of rearrangement. I can, I can think of, um, <coughs> if I start reading 1 and 3, I may have M2, M3, inverse, M1, M4. I should have labeled them here, which I don't. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but then if I take uh, 1 and 4, I may actually look at the inversion. Two and three might actually have something else, and two and four might actually have something else. So this is, these are all four possibilities of arrangements of MDSs co corresponding to four possible situations that you may actually have when you look at the um, sequenced material. So there uh, we ended up with, uh, so this is an equivalence class. And uh, so all of these are uh, equivalent representations of the same pattern um, of recombination that uh, is represented with these molecules. So we uh, took a convention that we wanted minimal number of inversions. We wanted the smallest lexicographic order of MDSs. And we wanted to delay the inversions as far as possible. So this is, this is how we represent the um, uh, the, the patterns. So in here, that pattern will be, I guess, the minimal number of inversions are these two, and uh, lex smallest lexicographic order is this one, and also the inversion is latest. <coughs> so this would be a representative of all these four uh, molecules. Um, so there was also the experimental evidence shows that IESs, simple IESs like this, um, are removed early in the process. And recombination actually appears later. So uh, what happens is that if I look at the word, like this word here that represents a uh, uh, contig, 5-5, uh, five five, which is this point, uh, this segment here, 5-5, five five, this would be two, three, and then five, five, and so forth. Um, five, five represents a loop, and this uh, loop is, ex is extracted early in the process, so it was removed. So we reduced the data whenever we saw these uh, two pointers next to each other. So, <coughs> and we also wanted to re rewrite the words in, in ascending order. So we removed five, five, and then um, we relabeled two, three, four, one, three, four, uh, with one, two, three, four, two, three, one, four, because it's easier for computer processing. That's it. They're representing the same graphs, except that um, we relabeled the vertices. Um, we were just interested in the patterns. What are the patterns that actually show up? So here's a, a data. There's no, so about 13,000 were not, uh, were, didn't have any rearrangement. Um, very simple rearrangement were a uh, majority of them, but uh, also a huge number of them showed up this particular pattern, which is odds, MDSs, then evens, odds and evens, or evens, then odds. Also, odds and evens reversed, in both cases, one or more than the other. So there are like a whole bunch of things that showed up in this. I, I, and if you follow up, you can see that um, this one is the same pattern. This one is actually not. But this one is the same pattern. So most of these are actually special cases of, uh, well, you know, dealing with the biologists. Biologists want to talk about inversion, translocation, translocation, and inversion, and things like that. This is what they want. But in fact, it's not like the, there's a portion of the molecule that translocated itself. I mean, 
there is a process that made this translocation, and this process we were trying to capture through the graphs and the smoothings of the graphs. So this is why we actually looked at the patterns. So here's, here's this pattern. This is this, the, the, the pattern. So there are a bunch of sausages that showed up in the graphs of this sort. <laughs> okay. <coughs> And if I look at the, the pointer sequence, then I have a repeat repetition of the pointers, one, two, three, up to n, and then one, two, three, up to n. So <coughs> uh, the other point, the other uh, segment that was interesting was when you have uh, more or less, imagine that um, there are lots of, these are not m1 and m2, right? There might be a whole bunch of loops in between, which we extracted during the first process of extraction of the loops. And there are a whole bunch of things here that we extracted the loops. But M1, M2 inverse and M2, M1 inverse are represented with these two graphs. So these are the vast majority of situations that appeared. And also this pattern showed up quite a bit in, in, the, uh, in the result. And um, all of the, if I look at the uh, graphs with three symbols, all of them showed up. Again, vast majority is repetition, one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three, three, two, one. And these are the graph structures that um, correspond to the, uh, these patterns. It was, um, Interesting to see because we, we identified this pattern odd and even, even and odd, which we call repeat and return words. <coughs> As I mentioned, the words are repeat or return or reverse, if you wish. Um, we tried to figure out for those patterns where these actually uh, words are not detectable, what happens if there are segments that actually represents those words? So in here, I have this segment here. As you can see, it looks like this segment here, right? And also this segment here. So these are the two segments that are more or less repeat and return word. And the rest of the stuff is more complicated. So if I remove those, Right? If I take detect this, 2323 three shows up somewhere. Then I have 567, 567 five, shows up somewhere. And uh, first we reduce the loops, we get rid of the loops. Then we get rid of these uh, segments, which are repeat and return. And we, at the end, we actually ended up with this, uh, as you can see, 1414. One, four. Again, a repeat word, 1414. Four, one, four. So this was. Um, in some sense, a nested appearance of repeat and return word in the segment. So we, pr we, we did this uh, process. We, <coughs> we started with iterations. We removed the loops, as we said before. Then we remove all maximum repeat and return words from the word W that represents the graph. And if, um, if at the end we don't have the empty word or uh, we don't um, get rid of all of the pointers, then we look at the iteration and uh, uh, we perform the iteration one more time until we actually cannot do that anymore. If the word that we obtained doesn't contain any repeat or return word, we stop or we actually end up with the empty word. And here's the data of those um, 800 um, or so, um, after the first iteration, vast majority actually uh, stopped and disappeared. There were second iteration, three iteration, and two uh, required four iterations of, uh, of, uh, of repeat and return. So they're nested repeat and return patterns inside. Um, and about 176 turned out to be um, non-reducible. So this cannot be reduced with repeat and return iterations. Out of those 176, um, 28 was stopped after the fir first iteration. 
uh, 123 after the, uh, I'm sorry, we could not do any iterations, 123, one iteration and so forth. And the one after five iteration, it stopped. Some of them, these are really complex, so, uh, and very complicated genes. Um, and, okay, I have a student that actually <laughs> went through the process and, and um, there are certain patterns that we wanted to detect in here, but they're not as easy to detect. So there's something that we call tangled coil that showed up, but I don't think I have a slide of that. Anyways, uh, remaining stuff. <laughs> this, is, this is just one portion of it. <laughs> as I mentioned, there's lots of things, one's inside the other. So inside this red gene, there are purples and light green and blue and uh, orange. And this is just a seg segment of it. Actually, there's lots of nested stuff, one's inside the other. And this is the study, well, I don't think that the, the graph uh, depiction of it is actually a very nice one. We probably need a different, nicer model to do this um, process. And uh, well, that will be a subject for another talk, I guess. <laughs> we have certain uh, observations there, but I won't go into that. Um, so lots of things to be done. Uh, yet, and things are way more complicated than we expected. Um, so this is my current group, and this is a group, uh, the Dennis did much of the work of the pattern, S he is now gone. <laughs> he was uh, in a five-year program, so, um, well, he works for Google now. <laughs> Jonathan is also uh, leaving the lab in, in, in August. He did also much of the database that we have. Um, what else do we have? Oh, repeat and return nested situation is due to uh, Ryan. Um, uh, Grant did uh, topological data analysis, actually, something that I guess you'll talk about tomorrow. <laughs> so we did that kind of analysis also for some of the processes. And um, Yes, Lucas is looking at patterns and uh, Jasper is looking currently of in one's inside the other, um, I guess, interleaving uh, genes. Um, I'm looking for students and postdocs and thank you very much. <laughs>